Welcome to the Angler Talk Podcast with Chris and Aaron. Brought to you by MissionMagicianTV.com. What is up, everybody? It's Chris back again with another weekly episode of Angler Talk. And this week, man, do I have a hell of a special guest. A man that needs no introduction at all. You've seen him on TV. You've seen him on YouTube. You've seen him in every single tournament you can possibly think of. I got Captain Frank Crisatelli, and it was an absolute honor to have him come on this show and talk to me. And just, I hope you guys will enjoy that. But before we get into that talk with Frank, man, the fishing is still red hot. I'm still seeing tuna picks. I'm still seeing mahi picks. I'm still seeing good fluke fishing. The stripers are starting to come around more and more thick. I mean, the full fall one has not started yet, but it will get here really, really soon, guys. Get out there and bend some rods. So with that being said, I hope you guys enjoy my talk with Frank. Check it out. And here I am with Frank Crescitelli, a man that really does not need an introduction, known by anglers all over the world. How's it going, Cap? Good, man. How are you doing? I can't complain, man. The only thing that would make my life a little bit better is I can ha- if I could have a rod in my hand every second of the day, man. But uh, <laughs> you you, you live the life, brother. I mean, I mean, I know it's a grind and I know it's a lot of hard work, man. But like, how, what got you into fishing? How did it all start for you? Nobody really knows. I, like, nobody in my family is a fisherman. I mean, I was raised by a single parent. My mother raised four kids on her own and we moved around a lot. So in looking back, I think that it's probably because I didn't need to be part of something to go fishing. You know what I mean? Like if I was in my, you know, a sport and we moved a different school or whatever, or, you know, different leagues in different parts, I lived in Staten Island my whole life. And, you know, but still like I could get a rod and go out on the jetty or go down the beach. I mean, but what my mother used to do, she'd probably be arrested for it today. But I used to be 11 years old, and she would take me to Great Kills Park, you know, leave mm. me, you know, down there. She'd have to take my my brother did play baseball, and uh, she'd go to bring him the games, whatever, do her life, come back, feed me lunch, come back four or five hours later. You know, I'm down there on this bulkhead with all these surly characters at 11 years old. But back then, that was normal. You know what I mean? The world was a different place. and But I just was always addicted. And then when I was 13, we moved across the street from the beach in Staten Island in this place called Ocean Breeze. And there was these storm sewers, which are attached to the creek system for the, you know, storm, storm surge and that. And so it was a pier, but it was really a storm sewer. We fished off of there. Oh, 200 days a year probably you know we, wow. that when i saw that water that's all i thought the house was a shambles <laughs> yeah but it was uh it was crushing from the water and that's all i cared about you know and i've just been just so addicted my whole life and it hasn't changed much to be honest with you <laughs> i hear you man a lot of people don't understand uh, like fishing in itself is kind of like a drug you know like i always say the tug is the drug and and when it hits you and it captivates you, I mean, there's no better feeling for guys like us. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, you more than me. I mean, you fish way harder than I do. I got to give you that. And uh, just so many things out there that when we're out there, you forget about the entire world. The bills don't matter. You know, you, your problems at home don't matter. Everything just comes first, full circle when you have that rod and reel in your hand, you know. And I mean, you do a phenomenal job. But I, I thank you. I, I think especially, you know, with salt water, there's a famous quote, you know, from um, that they use in Moby Dick. And it was actually a female writer who wrote it. It's like the cure for anything is in salt water, sweat, yes. tears and the sea, you know. And if you think about that, that's a pretty good guiding thing in life. Like, you know, and it, and it is true for me. You know, this other guy who's a captain who uh, was a professor there, Tony Delerney, he chartered in the East River for a long time. He said one time at, at one of the talks, he said, you know, the pull to the sea is a strong one. And if you feel it, it's like undeniable. You know, I'm yeah. paraphrasing, but it was something like that. And that kind of stuck with me, too. Like, you know, it's that it's it's just something that you really can't explain. We, yeah, I rode motorcycles. So I still have one. And we used to go to Harley rallies, and they used to show have a shirt that was like knucklehead, shovelhead, flathead, you know, all the engines of the Harleys. And it said, 
on the back and said, if I have to explain, you wouldn't understand. Like, you know, yeah. that's just was a part of that culture. And it really is people. It's funny how with fishing, people have such different ideas of what it entails. Yes. You know, to some people, they picture a guy sitting on the end of a dock in a five gallon bucket, you know, dipping his line in the water. And then, you know, if you could fast forward that scene to, you know, us going 100 miles offshore in the center console, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it just I agree. Like, it's not even the same thing, you know. But but that doesn't mean that I don't still sit on the end of a pier with my gun. Absolutely, if man. that's sometimes, what I got to do, you know, it's sometimes you just gotta head there. back to your roots, you know. And yeah, you know, I I totally be. I totally understand what you're talking about. I mean, when a lot of people ask me what is fishing to me, and it, it, it's it's such a simple question, but yet so hard to explain because. When that ocean hits you, you know, it's it's an unexplainable feeling of what you feel when you're out there. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I totally get what you're talking about, man. But I mean, if you think about, like, philosophically, like, our body is made up of, like, 75% salt water. So, yeah. like, maybe that's the connection, you know? And supposedly all life came from the sea, so maybe that's <laughs> that pull back there. But it's, you know, for me, it's just always been that place where I could just everything does melt away you know and Absolutely. you know i'm still as excited about it now as i was when i was a kid you know and that's you know that's 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 a big part of it like people say all the time like when i'd be on a charter I'd be like how could you be this excited about doing this many try to say when i stop feeling that way then i'll stop doing so much of it and you know in yeah. the last few years i have um we've focused more on the tv show and that and so i had to lay off a bunch of charters because you want to film when the fishing's good, but you also want to take people fishing when the fishing's good. So yeah, it kind of ran in conflict. So I have a couple of guys that cover most of this stuff for me today. And, you know, and I did lose a little bit of that, like, you know, you know, guys would complain, oh man, I got to do a double today. And like, maybe I did too, but like in really uh, deep down, I was like, this is awesome. Like when I was ending yeah. my first trip that I knew I had a second one to do, you know, it's, 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 so crazy i just dropped my friend off at the end of the lagoon here and uh, i picked him up for two hours of fishing because i was mending cast nets today and then i was yeah. like ah, i gotta try it out and then i'm like oh, i'll fish for a little bit and i dropped him off and his wife said i've been watching you you're you are addicted i was like <laughs> you know there's worse things you can be addicted to yeah, mean, absolutely just now when you told me this is going to be video too I, I went in there and i shaved and i'm washing my face and i'm like Man, what's these shiny things on my head now there's a bunch of guys that would say you know it's like glitter from being at you know a cabaret for yeah, me it's... it was peanut bunker scales you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i hear you man but like just to touch back you, you you spoke about growing up in staten island i mean you're fishing the shadows of one of the the busiest cities in the world you know a lot of people think of new york city they don't really think of fishing but oh, they yeah. don't understand the phenomenal fishery that we have here i mean these are the breeding grounds for pr pretty much all striped bass on the east coast i mean if you can tell people about fishing new york city what would what would how would you describe it so we are very fortunate in the fact that what you just said the two largest spawning biomasses in the east coast of the united states for striped bass we get to see both of those biomasses come by us on two annual migrations right so the fish that were born in the hudson river should theoretically spawn back in the hudson river so you have those fish that are wintering down south right coming up the coast go into the hudson river do their thing come back out so we get them coming in come back out the chesapeake fish that have spawned already you know down there they're going to migrate to cooler water so then they're going to come by us as well i mean one time in the fall in the rare to reach channel which is really the divider of New York Harbor and Raritan Bay. Everybody calls the whole body water Raritan Bay, but it's really, that's the dividing line. Yeah. And in that Raritan Reach Channel, it used to be a phenomenal peanut bunker run and blitzes for hours and hours, dude. I mean, legitimately. But at one time I had my friend Monty Burke, he writes at Forbes. He was writing a story for Forbes about fishing in the harbor. And we caught two striped bass. One was tagged in the Chesapeake and one was tagged in the Hudson River. Nice. So that in the same, you know, within the same half an hour of fishing. 
So those fish are, you know, mixing together. And those fish were, you know, they were all migrating back down south at that point. Uh, there's a great, great book that I became friends with the guy who wrote this guy, Dave Benedetto. It's called On the Run. And it's, a, you know, really kind of captures the whole migration. He started out in Maine and followed the fish down the coast. And that's how I ended up meeting him when he hit New York. Um, but even him, guy writing a book about you know the migration who very familiar with with new york city ended up when he was the editor of saltwater sportsman he lived very close in the city and still even though he was still surprised about you know the amount of fish that were there and and how good it was i mean a lot of times places don't live up to the reputation right yeah. of you know what i mean especially like <clears throat> i know in my mind that build up to say oh we're gonna go here we're gonna whatever it is and it's hard to live up to that i think you know it is down from what it was but yeah still you know phenomenal i'm here in beach haven long beach island this is where i live most of the time now and uh this south of barnegat inlet down here we don't get a good striper you know migration along the beach whether it's from the beach or planet whatever but these guys come with me up to New York Harbor and they, you know, flip out. They're like, yeah. oh, man, you know, I heard so much about this all the time and I never thought it would be, you know. And there's days where you can catch, you know, striped bass on top water plugs for just hours. And, Absolutely. you know, and again, that's not every day. You know, you got to put your time in. Uh, but if you do, it it definitely won't let you down. It's It's starting to come back again and it's still one of the best places I think I'm not overstating here in the world to catch, you know, okay. striped bass. I you agree, know? man. I mean, one of my favorite annual picks that I that I take and post every single year is when I get to catch a stripe, a beautiful striper in front of the biggest beacon of freedom in the world, which is the Statue of Liberty. I mean, it's awesome. I mean, you, you look at you see the scenery of downtown Manhattan and it doesn't get any more urban fishing than this. You know, it's just awesome in every single way yeah yeah for sure and that i mean and that contrast is the thing that blows people's minds a lot and you know we do the manhattan cup tournament every year in new york city this uh 20th year we just did uh it was like over the course of 23 years is the 20th time we ran a tournament and you know if these people that are big wall street clientele big real estate in new york city clientele so these people like some of them are taking ferries to work from atlantic highlands or wherever and they're coming to New York City and they're traveling those waters and don't believe how many <laughs> fish are really swimming there, you know? Exactly. You know, you get the old jokes less these days because the waters have cleaned up, but they'd be like, what are you going to catch? Jimmy Hoffa, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, car tire, but, you know, I said, well, that's, you know, New York Slam is like the, any automotive part. Uh, you know, any piece of clothing that somebody wore and like something that you can't name. And that's like the New York, yeah. slam, you know, but, and it used to be when I was a kid, the water was disgusting. Yeah. You know, you're talking about was only, I moved down to beach 76. It was only a couple of years after like clean water act. We were still putting raw sewage into the, into the ocean. Like, and New York back then, New York Harbor was everything that people negative things people said about it you know yeah. and yeah, and dump. just to see it rebound the way it is and these fish come back look more weak fish world records yeah. are within five miles of great kills harbor where i had a boat since so i'm 13 years old than any other place in the world okay so yes. that there's something to be said about that you know well, well, i had a weak fish world record on fly at one time that got beat there's five or six five. fly records now that are still standing you know that Joan Sherrod has like three women's uh, Ricky has oh, one or two men's like that, you know, like right outside of great Hills Harbor, the all tackle yeah. world record came from great Hills right at the point, you know, yeah. from a guy on, on the surf in New York city, in the five boroughs. So yeah, it's not like one of these places where they say, Hey, we're urban fishing. And it's like downtown Nashville or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, it's urban, but it's, it's a rural place, you know. This is one big up, up here. It's the concrete jungle, you know. And, yeah, and, 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 and people I, don't use, you know, they're not used to. They go to New York City for plays and you know restaurants and you know all that cultural stuff, fashion, and they don't think of the natural side of the world, which is really truly amazing. 
Absolutely. And I tell people all the time, man, you 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 hit a, a species that in, in my household is one of the most favorite things to eat. When I was a kid, you know, we used to fish on Cliffwood Beach um, from the surf, which is right across from yep. um, from Staten Island. And we used to catch weak fish. And I'm talking about 32 plus inches. You know, now to see a weak fish in the Hudson or or Raritan Bay area, it's it's kind of like it just doesn't happen anymore. It's good. Yeah, we had a bounce good run back three four years ago. We did an episode there, right by the Verrazano. We had some nice fish, and then it and down here. This was when when I bought this house down here twenty years ago. I was introduced to shrimp chumming, you know, with the grass shrimp. And with a fly rod, you could catch 20, 25 fish a tide, you know, every day. Didn't matter if it was 90 degrees out, middle of August. And then these fish just disappeared. And they're so cyclical in, you know, in their natural habitat. But but then last year we did that show with Meat Eater here. And the one guy had yes. found a study and it said something like 75% of the mortality of adult weak fish is due to dolphins. Yeah. When they head offshore and then heard, the I've purposes eat them, you know. So the crazy thing, and we're lucky that striped bass don't have too many predators. Um, and if we manage them right, like, listen, we went from eighty-four to eighty-eight total moratorium. I'll even rewind before it was the, you know, those fish were too toxic to eat. In the seventies, growing up down the beach and Staten Island, if somebody caught a striped bass, you knew how big it was, where he caught it, what mm -hmm. they caught it on. Because it was a big deal. One fish, dude. One yep. fish. When we started guiding and have two fly riders on a four-hour trip and have 50 yep. on fly. You know, like, so that's how much it changed. And then we saw a big downturn there. It's much better now. A lot of much bigger fish, um, which the big ones kind of go last. So that's why they're still here. But it, for me, the best thing we did in striped bass management was eliminate the very, keeping the very large fish. Yeah, you know, I mean, the, it's definitely that's the that's the breeder fish, you know, and um, striped bass start to breed after I think what twenty six, maybe twenty eight inches. Yeah, or twenty six, like twenty eight inches, something like that. And then, and, but uh, not all of them will ever grow to be forty inches. You know, just like you know, in in the animal world, there's you know, a big buck has babies, he produces other big bucks. You know what I mean, like. For guys that are deer hunters, like it's just natural. So if you're taking all those really big, superior, genetically superior, very good breeders, they're obviously good at it. They've done it for 20 or 30 years. Like leave them alone. And, you know, then the, you leave them alone from 84 to 88, total moratorium in, in New York, right? Couldn't keep a striped bass under any circumstances, any size. Ten years later, that fish tree had rebounded to amazing great. Tremendous size. I think in the 2000s, it was like the it was like a 26 million fish biomass of striped bass that were migrating, a migrating biomass of 26 million fish. And I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that he wrote in their book it was the largest migration of wild animals in the world. So you think That's of those amazing. herds of of uh, wildebeest or whatever in the plains of Africa, right? You know, yeah. you think about that, right? That's a great visual. Like, you see these the helicopters. 28 million these, fish, man. That's a right? lot. So 26 million fish. Think when you're looking down on that, if you could see into the water what that would look like, you know? It's probably looks it's like the, the black abyss over there, you know? <laughs> one thing one thing that I do admire about guys like you, and uh, you mentioned Meat Eater when Joe Cermelli was there, who is... You know, probably the entire influence behind me trying to do. Oh, really? Oh, that's cool. And, you know, you guys take that fly rod and you guys target species that were not meant to catch on the fly. You know, like, I mean, you've caught tuna on the fly. Yep. Yep. Yellow fin. Striped bass. Blue fin. I mean, I mean, that's just insane. So what gives you that? You know what? I'm going to go catch this thing on the fly today. What gives you that motivation to go do that? It's, I think it's more dogged determination, you know, really. It's hard, dude, when you, listen, everybody wants to go out there and find busting tuna fish on the surface, right? The yeah. amount of days that it truly happens, you know, those days that it truly happens where you intersect with them, right? Like 
the weather's good enough that you could go, you got the boat to go, you got the time to go, and then you intercept with those fish when it like it's a rare happening, okay? It's yeah. happened last three, four years, been very good. Prior to that, super rare. Now you, it can happen if you put your time in. But when you're out there and these fish are busting, right, and you're catching them on spinning gear, like, yeah. dude, that's as good as it gets, right? Absolutely. Until you then you say, I want to try and get one on fly. So, <laughs> you know, just the casting limitations. Even if you're a good caster, you throw 80, 90 feet, whatever. You can only do it a certain way into the wind, right? So that boat has to be positioned the right way. The fish have to come up in that way where you can, you know, get that angle of the cast. Like, and if you don't fly fish, none of that makes sense. When you got a spinning rod, 360 degrees, they're over there, they're over there, cast behind you, it doesn't matter. And you can yeah. throw 150, 200 feet or whatever, you know? So you got to like say to yourself, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try and get one on fly today and you got to stick with it. And yeah, the biggest, so the biggest bluefin, my friend landed, who's the sage rep, Bill Dawson, after we bled it and it was like four hours later, it was 98.5 on a certified scale. So on on a massive bluefin. Yeah. Uh, uh, Massive bluefin. This is insane. I mean, and then I landed at like a 40 something pound yellow fin on a 10 weight and it was awesome. And that day, literally, we had rods in the rod holder. They were getting bit, and my mate yelling at me, pick up this rod. And I, nope. And I just had to fly. And yeah. we were originally going for the six-pound tippet record on fly. But yeah. I could tell you that in between strips, I didn't even have the line in my hand. It's under my finger. And a tuna fish would bite it and not <laughs> even bend the rod and break the tippet. You wow. know, I did that like six times, dude. And then I was like, okay, enough of this record. <laughs> I want to <laughs> catch one. So the most exactly. you can put on uh, to be, uh, you know, fly legal is 20 pound tippet. I put that on there and I ended up landing a uh, fish or two. And it was, it's awesome. You know, again, you got to like it. Uh, why I liked it, I got into fly fishing when in the mid 90s, the fishing wasn't that great. We were catching small fish and we we're using ultralights and, you know, just trying to change it up a little so it's more fun, you know? Yeah. And then my one friend said, we should get fly rods. And I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> Let's get them. We had a tuna trip booked on a head boat. It got canceled. I remember I had 350 bucks from that trip. And I said, all right, well, can we get fly rods? And he's like, yeah, we can. That was the cheapest fly rod trip I have purchased yeah. a trip in my life. <laughs> but we did get <laughs> fly rods and we, we you know, and it was trial and error. And then I joined this fly club, Bayshore Fly Riders in Jersey. And it was cool because everybody was learning together. Like everybody yeah. had just started about that time, 39 years ago, 29 years ago, whatever it was. Wow. That was my, That's yeah, awesome. it was my 30th birthday. So 29 years ago. And, but everybody was kind of learning together. Guys like I use this line, I use this fly. And, you know, it was just like reigniting the fishing you know, spark, I guess, if you will, Absolutely. you know, no, no, no. I say, so those are things, uh, those are things that you look to do if you're getting tired in the sport. Like if you think you're yeah. getting, you know what I mean? Like it's getting a little getting old or, you know, to try and do something different like that, you know, Absolutely. try fly fishing or try going for these records or whatever, you know? I mean, something like, like the Bayshore Fly Club you mentioned is something I might want to look into. Um, I know there's a captain in um, one of my fishing clubs, High Marsh Striper Club. He enjoys fly fishing. He uh, told me, he's like, yeah, why don't you give it a whirl? I made one cast. I think I casted maybe like 12 feet. So I do got a lot to learn. So maybe joining something like that is definitely going to gonna inspire me to do something best because better because I have a friend who goes upstate every year for salmon, and it's all on the fly, and he keeps inviting me. And I'm just like, dude, I don't know how to cast a fly to save my life, brother. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But there is one thing I did want to ask you. And I don't think it makes sense in any way possible, but if there's anybody that can do it, which unless you have done it already, have you ever thought about fly fishing for a billfish? Oh, yeah, we did it. We did a show on it in Guatemala. Oh, that, man. Yeah, they, those guys have that dialed in, you know, yeah. and, you know, there'll be people who say, oh, that's not fly fishing. It's <laughs> IGFA legal fly fishing. And there's nobody better than those guys in Guatemala just because they 
the sheer numbers that are there for sailfish, you know. We were there for six days. I learned more in six days than I did in six years here, you know, <laughs> because, you know, if you're offshore, a very good white mullein day would be six to ten bites. You land six fish. You'd be arguably in a release category in any of the tournaments here, except for like the ones that are a little more down south. Like you'd be in the running, you know, we've yeah. won money with six releases, eight releases, you know, in tournaments up here. So, but now you go down there and we were there and it was not great. They said, and we were getting 20, 25 bites a day. Wow. Feeding 25 billfish. You see their habits, you see their, their behavior that, you know, the little differences that, you know, if you're paying attention, you know, you drop it back a little bit, pause it, wait, see what they do. Like you could, you're 20 times learning. you get to do that in a day yeah. you know in, in a year you know you'd be happy to get 20 times you, you know to try to a, a teased up fed fit you know right to the back of the boat but those guys you know they're the eats are amazing you know they tease them right to the back of the boat you put the fly in the water you let them see the fly while the boat's still in gear but you can't mm -hmm. hook the fish then right so you got to wait once he sees it and that's the last thing in the water now you pull it out of the air, into the air. The guy puts the boat in neutral, put it back in the water, and now you got to twitch it a little bit, whatever. But that's the last thing that fish saw. So he's looking for, and the eats are just, oh, we got some in slow mode that were just sick, you know. Absolutely. It's crazy. Man. And, you know, it's 20-pound tippet still, so, and these are big sailfish. So yeah, I mean, the just, record, just... this will blow your mind, the record, unofficial record for billfish on fly. I believe my friend Jim Turner holds it, who used to own the Casa Vieja Lodge there in Guatemala. 57 sailfish on fly in one day. Wow. That's and you say, how's that possible? But if you saw the way they do it, and, you know, as soon as you hook the fish, the guy's ramming it into reverse, you know, and you're making up Man. and you're fighting the fish. And it's, just, it's, the, it's like watching a well-oiled machine to see between the captain and the mates and the boats. You know, if you've ever been to one of those lodges where they, they have it dialed in like that, it's a whole nother thing, you know? Yeah, you definitely just gave me a new fishing destination. I think I'll be <laughs> visiting Guatemala sometime in my life. It's awesome sure. there. It's awesome. I mean, but just listening to the way you're talking it, about it, you know, seeing as you, you're still a student to it every day, I think that's what truly makes you a master of your craft. And, you know... Kudos to you, man. You you do a great job for sure. Man. Well, thank you. I mean, there's a there's a thing that uh, so I did a lot of Tony Robbins training in my life to keep myself, you know, focused on my goals in life. It really made a big difference to me. And there's some of these things you take away from these seminars. And the one thing it says it says repetition is the mother of skill, right? So like that, you keep doing it over and over again. And if you are paying attention, you will get better. And that's why, you know, we did the thing with the TV show for the records and, <clears throat> you know, the tournaments. In a tournament, you have a certain time that you have to fish on this day, okay? Mm -hmm. Weather aside, fish, you know, activity aside, this is the day. If you want to get good, challenge yourself and do that if you've never done it. It makes you think about it 100% of the time. You know, you're fully dialed in, you're fully committed. Um, most of the time you have money on the line. If not, dude, in a Manhattan Cup, we don't give away money. It's only for trophies, charity tournament, all catch and release. You want to talk about a competitive tournament, you know, you absolutely it is a highly coveted thing, you know. <laughs> and because you know you're just dialed in, for me, that works, you know. Maybe for somebody else, their mind works differently and they have better days when they're just out relaxing by themselves. If I don't go out with a goal, even fishing by myself, I catch the least amount of fish than I do on the times when I say, okay, I want to catch a weak fish today, a big weak fish or whatever it is, you know, or I'm going to try and catch a weak fish on fly today. <clears throat> it just makes you figure out, even when you're catching, if you can't catch them the way you wanted to, like, let's say, you know, what happens with fly a lot. Either it's too deep or too fast, and you just can't get the fly down there for the right amount of time. Like now, you start to think, all right, if they're here, where else might they be, right? Where I can't catch them with the fly. So then your brain starts to work, and you start to figure out, all right, well, this is, you know, there's a flat, and then there's a hole here. 
So this water is coming off the fly into this hole, whatever it is, you know, and you just that that works for me, you know, Absolutely. and that's why a lot of people like I turned off on tournaments because they say, oh, you know, it takes the, you know, the fun out of fishing. Fishing supposed to be this or that. Absolutely. For, not. You know, my friend Paul Bork, who's my producer of the show, he he was the coach of the U.S. youth fly fishing team. Those kids won five gold medals in the world five years in a row. He's on the U.S. You know, people don't even know we have a U.S. fly fishing team. Yeah. We do. And it's made of, yes, adult anglers. Like, you know, they have an adult division. Those guys on that team are, like, when I hear him talk about trout fishing, like, I'm like, man, I guess that's why I don't catch so many trout when I go trout fishing. <laughs> yeah, he's you know? dialed in, like, yeah. Like, yeah, as absolutely. dialed in as we are in the ocean, where these fish are swimming hundreds or thousands of miles, these guys are fishing to fish that are a lot of them stocked in these rivers, right? You know, like within this mile of river, there's going to be whatever a thousand fish or however they, they <laughs> calculate those blue ribbon streams in that. Yeah. And still though, to be really good that, or that little bit percentage better than the average guy, it takes that dissecting. You know, we did a lot of video underwater video from way back before we even thought about, you know, doing videos, you know, for any kind of promotion. And we learned so much. We tied a fly to a camera that, that back then I had a sea view camera. It was probably two and a half feet long. Looked like Jeez. a torpedo, like the fins on it, every, the whole thing, dude. Oh, and the awesome. camera was in the front. And we used to troll that thing backwards and tie a fly to it. And you'd see these stripers come up and swim away. Come up, swim away. And, it, and you say to yourself, why are they not hitting it? Well, we couldn't give the camera action by we start pulling the camera it changes the view and but then that's yeah. when you get the hits and they're like ah uh. or if there was five of them then they got competitive and then they hit so like my mind ever from that moment whatever 30 something years ago 40 years ago i i always think about what is the fish seeing and i also think like how many times were you just reeling and not twitching or stopping or speeding up. And a striped bass came up, looked at your plug, and went, nah, I'm not going to have that. And you didn't yeah. even know. <laughs> yeah. But, but when you see it from the camera view, you go, yeah, there's a lot more down there than, than I thought. And they never touched my bait, but they were interested. So then I started thinking, well, how do you, you know, entice them? So it's just people are going to watch us and go, upset it you know obsessed not <laughs> yeah but <laughs> it's but just the way but, it is. but that makes the difference between an actual master of his craft angler and anybody who just goes out there with a five gallon bucket i mean anybody can catch them on the good days right but guys like you are the ones that go out there when it's blowing 20 coming out of the south you know what i'm saying and you know what to do and you know you spoke about the show so how did that come about you know the fin chasers did they approach you did you approach them because obviously you're a guy who, who reputation precedes them and you know how did that come around for you so we did i noticed that if anybody was coming into new york harbor to write an article or do a show that i got the call most of the time and so i'm like you know it's fun doing the shows a lot of times it was a bit frustrating because i remember these guys from saltwater sports and they did a, a whole cd series one time and they they wanted to come up and fish with me and i didn't know those guys before then uh florida sport florida sportsman and okay. they said oh you know we got your name from so and so and you know, want to come up there and i'm like they're like yeah we want to you know try and catch stripers and uh we're going to be up there like september 17th or something and i'm like mm -hmm. they didn't know stripers here. <laughs> so, <laughs> like it's a good idea but you know yeah, and, you know and then so i'm like you know what do you do so you're like now nah, the pressure's on right you know but I, the funny thing is never failed in somebody else's show Yep. To go out there and do exactly what we said, you know, when <laughs> there was times where I did it and like we had total zero days, you know, like yeah. for my own show. But I, I thought like, you know, that these guys are asking me, the shows are doing good, like, you know, there was something to it. And it was, I've always been love promoting the sport. Like I legitimately 
no bullshit inside. Like, I know that fishing saved my life, you know? Yeah. Growing up, how I grew up, where I grew up, some kids in my neighborhood didn't make it out, didn't make it out intact, whatever. I had to fish. I had to be there that next morning. You know, I had to be up early. I had to be on the beach. Like, there wasn't no, there was no person driving me, no adult that was like, we're going fishing tomorrow. Like, you know, these overbearing yeah. parents. It was all me putting pressure on myself. But it, it kept me interested. It kept me mostly out of trouble. And, you know, <laughs> but but certainly it, it kept me, it gave me a continuous focus. And, you know, if I wanted to be good at it, I knew I had to do certain things, you know. Yeah. And, you know, my brother played baseball, I said. And, he, you know, very good baseball player. Had adult tryouts in his life. He got Crohn's disease in college when he was playing ball, and that kind of put his career on hold for a while. Never gave up on it. Still a baseball nut. And, it, you know, to me, I could care less, but I never played on, you know. I played yeah. on one team when I was 12 years old, and it was the New York City version of the Bad News Bears. <laughs> Legit, 100%. It was a CYO team in the you know, early 70s in New York City. So you know what that was like, right? We were a yeah. mess. And I was terrible. My claim <laughs> to fame in baseball, I would bunt on two strikes, you know? Yeah. And they, and I'd get it, and I'd bunt, and, and they, the coach would go, why are you doing that all the time? I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, if you bunt on two strikes and it hits the bat and you don't get a, you know, it doesn't go in the field, you strike out. I go, oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that's my baseball that's career. That's so, <laughs> the, you know, fishing was it, you know. It, but there's a lot of zero days, dude, like legit. Yeah, you know, if anybody tells you well, every day I go out there, we kill them. Yeah, we all know you're full of, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I agree with you, man. One more thing I wanted to talk to you about is I see the tackle wall behind you. <laughs> and uh, I am fortunate enough to own – a few of your baits. I call them Chrisatelli's. I'm not 100% sure what the brand name is. I believe it's yeah, Guide it's, Yeah, it's Guide Secret. That's these uh, yeah. yellow boxes here behind me. I know kind of uh, same thing with, like, we did a lot of tackle testing for people over the years. And, you know, a lot of times they we test stuff for people. And it's so far late in the production, like, they didn't make the changes that were yeah. needed, you know. So we, we did started doing this. And. You know, what the idea was, me and, you know, other friends of mine that were guides and Sharpies, like, what's your favorite bait, you know? And so my one friend, he was like, Big O from Cotton Cordell. That was the lure, man. Like, that was like yeah. the guys who caught Big Stripers. They, don't, they haven't made it in 25 years. So I looked it up. The patent expired like 35 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and nice. so I was like, you know, they weren't making the bait anymore. People were selling old ones online for 25 bucks. So I'm like, well, I'll take that bait. And, you know, we, we threw wired it. We put BMC hooks on it, Wolverine split rings. So anything that you would do to it as somebody who knows what to do, you know, we do that right out of the box. So we, and each bait's got a story about, you know, no longer made or, you know, this was a wood only plug that we made now in plastic. You know, the yeah. guys, uh, you know, gave me permission who made this killer pajama pencil was called and that's my papa pencil largest yeah. plastic pencil popper in the world like all of that's got a story from that because just like like i'm a gearhead of auto mechanic by trade and mm -hmm. so i guess i love the mechanics of a lot of the fishing stuff as you can tell there's a problem with purchasing <laughs> hey man you're not the only one my basement looks just as crazy <laughs> man but I'm you know this is where i spend all my time so when i'm not fishing i'm in here and, you know, my one female dog, if you could see her, she's laying there next to me. I could be here 12 hours. That dog will not leave my side. She's my yeah. fishing partner. She's with me all the time. And, you know, I, it's just like, there's always something to do. I mean, that's the other part of it, right? When you're yeah. on the water, sure, you're fishing, whatever. But then there's the getting the tackle ready, investigating new, you know, new types of tackle or rigs or whatever and mm -hmm. tying rigs. And, you know, absolutely, it, it's man. all I mean surrounds yeah, the it's obsession. a very it's a very quality bait good, with good gear on it and you know I I remember watching an episode I think you were in Lake Erie memory's yep. not that great yeah yeah and yeah I you're saw right. you I saw you grab a marker 
and you just did a couple arms lines on it because orange was the color that was hit and dropped it down and bam, it got smacked, man. I mean, so the versus that you can go to the Great Lakes and catch giant smallmouth, but you can also go in the Hudson and catch humongous stripers on them. I mean, that's amazing. It's a good quality bait that is so versatile, you know what I'm saying? And you know, the guy, the awesome the, my friend Jim Hanley, who was the guide on that episode, he'd been guiding up there for 40-something years, actually got into the Outdoor Hall of Fame this year, which is a big achievement. And that's the other thing. Like, you don't get a lot of recognition in this sport that you do in other sports, but that's a whole nother, we could do a whole nother episode on that. But, you know, he said, oh, yeah, it's got to have blue and orange or pink. And I had no baits like that. So I just took a white yeah. bait, scratched off some paint, and, you know, took one of those paint markers. And, dude, yeah. like, how many times did you hear, like, dude, there's a bite, but it's only the whatever color. You know what I mean? Like exactly. Wonder Bread. Wonder Bread. Yeah. Like, that was a hot <laughs> color for years, right? You remember that? So, yeah. like, say Wonder Bread. What's Wonder Bread? Well, whatever. That's what the Wonder Bread package is like. You know, like. Or they call it clown, dots. some people, right? Orange yeah. dots, blue dots, and like, but you, you don't have to go buy a bait. Just scratch the paint up, dude. They make these great, you know, I forget the name brand of it, but there's these pen markers that have paint in them, you know, and that's what I used. Yeah. And you just paint it up, put some stripes on it, and do whatever. I mean, that's something to do, like, you know, to have fun, too. Like, you know, when yeah. things get tough, or they're not hitting this color or that. I mean, I don't Kinda know. Like I've seen where color matters so much and i've seen where it does it and but yeah, it's it, like it's like tony maja i mean we're out there with the spoons and stuff and then you know you were fishing a chartreuse spoon and like he, we didn't bring the whole assortment of spoons that oh this color is gonna hit grabs a can of spray paint on look bam <laughs> two minutes out there it's getting whacked man and it's just like it just shows people like after 40 feet color really doesn't matter you know we we know that yeah. you know the depth erases the color but like these surface fish on these surface bites you know i mean the color does play a big portion of it and just to watch that that was probably one of the coolest things i think i ever saw when i yeah, I yeah. Saw you pull that's... out that marker make a few lines on it and drop it down i was just like oh man it's freaking awesome i tell you so tony's a very good friend another staten island guy you yeah. know who's Staten Island got some props and some fishermen boy i tell oh, you absolutely. you know absolutely so you you think about new york city you think eh, whatever and we still get it today but it's 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 a cool spot, and if uh, if people get an opportunity, we got a lot of good fishing to coming up yet this year, and that you know fall runs about to happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, dude, Halloween week you can't make a mistake. It, if they're not there by then, they're not going to be there. I mean, yeah. and there's been some years where they weren't there, you know. But it's it's been the last few years of falls have been really good, and you know they, you can catch them almost any way you want if you put your time in. Absolutely, man. I mean, Arthur Kills last year produced. <laughs> that you know, was great. December 27th was my last striper trip I did out there. I went out with a buddy named Jose, and we threw swim shads. We threw flutter spoons. No matter what you threw at them, they were chomping it, you know, and to see fish hanging around that long yeah. it just shows you how great that this area is to fish in, man. And if anybody has a chance to fish, New York and New Jersey area, the urban fishing, whatever you want to call it. I mean, take advantage. You're going to bend some rods and you're going to have a blast doing it. And you can always call Frank to put you on a hot spot. Yeah, yeah, for sure, dude. We're, it's all about, I, we want every, if anybody thinks that in today's day and age, there's any secret spots anymore, <laughs> they're delusional. Um, yeah. I always say, like, we did a lot of conservation work for a lot of years. And I still do it. And, you know, I always say that. If you can tie a string from somebody's heart to anything, like any, that that was our thing for like fundraising and charity stuff. Like if people are connected somehow, then when you pull on that string, they feel it. So the only way to get connected is to be out there and doing it, right? And, you know, that call came about my friend Monty Burke, the guy who was at Forbes, she wrote a story about like these mountain climbers that they said that their activities were disrupting these mountain lines or whatever. And that it was a real problem and it was a big enough issue that he wrote a story about it whatever and 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 we were talking the one day about how people you know are so protective of how good the fishing is and they don't want people to know but yeah we're trying to protect them and he and and i my mind went to that like that was a real issue with these mountain lions let's say yeah i have no connection to that i'm not a mountain climber <laughs> you know, i'm not a mountain lion lover like 
But to those people, it mattered a lot. So to us, you know, these fisheries issues matter a lot. If you just get somebody out there one time, they get connected to it. And then, you know, they're at a cocktail party and they're with somebody who's in Congress and they mention some bill that's coming up. Like you can't imagine how those connections and that web really does continue on. And it helps us, you know, so the more people that are turned on to the sport, what you're doing is a great job, man. The, the, you know, Thank this you. kind of stuff people can connect to whenever they want. It's there waiting for them, you know. Whenever they want to, ha they have the time. You know, it's not like the old days when, when I was in school, like everybody watched Happy Days on Tuesday night. <laughs> yeah. That's when it was on, you know. Yeah. Just the beauty of today is that, you know, that it's all available all the time. And you you pick up one thing of a show or a documentary or you go to a, a seminar, you pick up one thing to me that's worth it, right? Because it all goes back to that learning thing. It, the day I think I know everything, I'm done. Exactly. You know, I really. hear you. All right, Frank. So before I let you go, man, why don't you let the people know where they can find you, check out your show, and pick up some guide baits, and I will drop some links down in the description below. Sure, man. So the show is called The Fin Chasers, and it's finchaserstv.com is the website. And then there you'll see we have stuff on some on Amazon, Vimeo. Uh, there's stuff still on Discovery On Demand where we aired the last time. And then, but if they go to the website, you find it there. And then also we have a YouTube channel as well. And then the lures are, are it's Guide Secret is the brand. It's guidesecret.com. And I will tell you that in the 10 years that we're doing it, anybody who's ever bought baits for me, you hope that everyone works flawlessly, right? That's an yeah. unimaginable goal. Anybody that's ever had a problem with a bait, dude, I tell them, send it back to me. I want to see what's wrong so I know. We send them a new bait. Like, it's about the sport. You know, if you went into this sport to make money, wrong sport. My friend yeah. says, my friend says, you know how you make a million bucks disappear? I go, how? He goes, take a million bucks, go into the fishing business. It'll disappear. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but like it's I about the people, passion. You know, it's, it's like I tell world. people, how do you be become a millionaire fishing? You start off as a billionaire. <laughs> yeah, that's what i tell people you know it is the most expensive way to get a free dinner and that's what it is <laughs> but uh frank i want to uh i want to say thank you for taking the time and coming out for uh, yeah, uh on here with us it was an absolute pleasure to have you on the show man i appreciate your time it was a pleasure us. for me as well man i look forward to we'll we'll do a, another one on some of these other subjects we touched on thanks so absolutely, much absolutely man thank you and that was so much fun sitting down talking with Frank. I mean, literally a master of his craft. The man has been doing this for years. And to see somebody, you know, who's been doing this that long still get so excited about what he does. I mean, it's awesome. I mean, with all the things that he does with, you know, the Wounded Warrior Foundation and the kids and the guide service, making quality baits and still producing a TV show showing what he does. I mean, this guy his schedule must be insane but for him to take the time and come out and and talk with me for you guys to listen i mean that was just awesome and i can't thank him enough but for this week unfortunately i am out of time i hope you guys get out there and bend some rods and i'm gone tight lines guys <laughs>